a good time to get started. So let me actually first start with uh, uh, welcoming everyone to our theoretical and computational biophysics seminar. Uh, today, I have the pleasure to uh, host uh, Professor Delamati from <clears throat> Stockholm. Before introducing Lucy, I would like to remind everyone to please turn off your camera. Uh, uh, we slowly transition you from attendees to panelists so you can actually talk and uh, use your camera. Uh, uh, um, use your camera to interact with the speaker. So please turn off your microphones. I think I made a mistake and turn on your camera if you're willing, that would give a more personal feel uh, with the speaker. Uh, and then as regarding questions, we try to actually save them for the end of the talk. If there is a really burning question, then let me know, type it in the chat box and uh, somehow signal us and we can, we hopefully actually can ask Lucy a couple of times and interrupt him. I hope she doesn't mind <laughs> a couple of times. So we usually keep our seminars rather informal, Lucy, and I hope that uh, you will be fine with this arrangement. So with that, uh, uh, let me uh, introduce Lucy before starting with the seminar. So it's really my great pleasure to uh, introduce Professor Lucy Delamonte, our seminar speaker today. So Lucy was trained initially as a chemist at, in, at the University of Lorraine in France. He re she received his, her bachelor degrees in chemistry and her master's in theoretical and computational chemistry, as well as her PhD from the same university <clears throat> during which he, she worked with uh, Monir Tarek, one of our colleagues who is active in membrane protein simulations. And that was the time she started playing with ion channels, I believe. After that, she moves uh, <clears throat> across the Atlantic and joins the group of Mike Klein to do a postdoc with Mike Klein at the Temple University. And during that time, I believe she received also a fellowship from Marie Curie, a prestigious fellowship in, in Europe. Then she moves back to Europe and joins the group of Ursula <coughs> Rotlisberger in, in Lausanne, where she continued working on computational biochemistry and chemistry. And, uh, and then after that, she joined the faculty at Stockholm University, where she went through the ranks rather quickly. And she is now associate professor in computational biophysics at KTH, Stockholm University, and Sci Life Lab. Um, so Lucy is in a, and it's regarding projects and her interest is scarily close to what we are interested in. <laughs> she does almost everything that we, are, we do here in Urbana, focusing on membrane protein modeling, development of MD analysis techniques, uh, development application enhanced sampling methods, ion channels, transporters, and then the small molecule interactions with membranes. So this is really, um, I mean, I jokingly said this is scary, but it's really wonderful to have a colleague who is so close to us in terms of their interests. Uh, and today she's gonna work actually about their, relatively speaking, recent work on G-protein coupled receptors uh, uh, and using uh, not only MD, but other computational techniques. Thank you very much for being with us, Lucy. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Emad. I, uh, I appreciate actually the invitation a lot for the reasons you just outlined. It's really nice to talk to a like-minded crowd. So thanks a lot. And um, I hope you guys learned something from me and that um, <clears throat> I can also learn from your questions and so on. So I really welcome feedback as uh, Imad was saying. Uh, this is a relatively new field for us uh, in terms of uh, G-protein coupled receptors. And um, I chose to present this project because I think uh, it's maybe one of the most advanced we have methodologically. And I thought there would be something for everyone, even people who are not so interested in uh, GPCRs. Mm -hmm. Um, but uh, so I guess I don't need to go in great detail because Emad did a good job explaining this already. We work on um, a bunch of uh, membrane proteins and uh, 
my historically my background has been in voltage gated ion channels but since i joined um, the kth and was able to start my research group it became possible to have more uh, applications with more people working on this and in the context of collaborations with the local collaborators we started working on g-protein coupled receptors and sugar transporters um, but also, um, we're not really a group, I think, I would say, that actually develops methods, but we do pay attention to the methods that are being developed around and try to, you know, take advantage of the most useful ones. And in some cases, we also do a little bit of, uh, you know, tweaking, which might be called development in uh, <laughs> somebody else was presenting. Uh, and that's both in the area of sampling and analysis. So um, what I'm going to talk today about is going to be on G-protein coupled receptors. I'll cover aspects of sampling and aspects of um, uh, feature extraction for analysis. Uh, and we'll leave the rest for another time. So G-protein coupled receptors are very interesting proteins, in my opinion, uh, not least because they're really important physiologically. But from a biophysics perspective, I think they're really quite fascinating because they're both small enough that we can simulate them in a relatively efficient way. And they're complex enough that they have all the challenges uh, that we'd like to, to tackle. Um, so the idea is that G-protein coupled receptors are made of seven transmembrane helices, as you can see on the scheme to the right. And uh, they tend to bind ligands at the extracellular domain. And this triggers a conformational change in the receptor such that um, an intracellular response will be triggered. And that is because the binding of the ligand will stabilize an activated state that is able to bind G proteins, arrestins, or other intracellular uh, binding partners. So this is a, a scheme made by a traditional biophysicists, I suppose, that shows what a one-dimensional conformational landscape might look like. And um, this basic uh, mechanism that I was just describing before, uh, as you can see on this scheme, is actually an oversimplification, only because um, there are multiple um, metastable states along the activation pathways, maybe several resting states and several activated states. But the ligands, and specifically agonist ligands, tends to stabilize the active light states and then uh, trigger the downstream um, uh, cascade of uh, signaling. Um, so even that is an oversimplification. I think this will not be a surprise for anybody in this room, but uh, being able to project a conformational landscape along one degree of freedom is usually uh, quite a big simplification and definitely not easy to do. And this process tends to be much more high dimensional. And then on the biological side, um, there's a process called biosignaling, uh, which has to do with the fact that some ligands tend to favor uh, signaling through a G protein and some other ligands tend to favor signaling through a restin uh, binding. And this is not easily understood by just looking at the shape or in the chemistry of the ligand. And so that's been a big interest, uh, uh, both biophysically and in terms of drug development. And uh, I should also say that a big motivation for working on these proteins is that, of course, they're one of the most common uh, classes of drug targets, which uh, provides opportunities for, um, for working with industry and having an impact. Um, so Currently, we have a, a project actually working on uh, the dopamine receptor in the context of uh, trying to find solutions for treating Parkinson. But when I started uh, working on GPCRs, we figured it would be a good idea to start with a prototype receptor for which there is a lot of experimental data known to be able to see if our methods worked. So that's what I'm going to focus on today. And um, in that context, the receptor I'm talking about today is the beta-2 adrenergic receptor. And it's a prototype for class A uh, GPCRs. And so there are structures of, the, of this receptor in different states, as well of, as of many receptors. But this, uh, I think, was the first GPCR that was uh, ever crystallized and for which the, uh, the structure was solved. And so um, the kind of 
traditional way for uh, biochemists to look at this protein is to consider uh, that ligand binding here at the extracellular domain in gray triggers the conformational change at the intracellular domain by uh, the flipping of a cascade of so-called microswitches. And in this vocabulary, microswitches are simply just um, degrees of freedom that um, change um, when you consider different um, structures. So uh, to introduce you to the system in a little bit more detail, ligand binding here occurs at the extracellular orthosteric binding sites. And um, usually there is even a, um, a hydrogen bond that is formed between serine 207 with the ligand. And uh, the microswitch that uh, can be used to describe this, uh, the, what happens when the, when the ligand binds is a distance between these two residues that are shown in red. And then as you go down towards the intracellular binding site, you will find a microswitch here in the middle of the receptor, uh, which involves two hydrophobic residues that are shown here in pink. That is called the connector region. And uh, just below that, uh, another microswitch that involves uh, uh, the interaction between two tyrosines that can be mediated by a, a water molecule. That's called the YY distance because of, it's a distance between two tyrosines. And then finally, just below that, we'll have um, a distance uh, that uh, uh, between an arginine and uh, an E residue that uh, can be formed in a specific state. So that's called the ionic lock. And you can see that in the activated states, this, um, this distance is large in the uh, resting state, this distance is uh, small. Um, so this is known even before we start doing uh, any simulations by just uh, looking at, um, at distances between uh, residues uh, in different um, structures. But uh, we figure, as well as many others, including all of you, that uh, molecular dynamic simulations can be very insightful because it enables us to go beyond the static uh, structure, right? And it also enables, in principle, to consider uh, the entire environment and the effect of the environment. So let's say we're in a situation that is a little bit closer uh, to the native system than uh, when you have to solve a, say, crystal structure. And the reason this uh, type of technique is uh, really powerful for drug design is that, of course, um, the drugs act at an atomistic level. So we kind of need to have all the details in place, any type of hydrogen bond, including its population and so on, to, in principle, be doing uh, accurate drug design. Um, but people will argue that molecular dynamic simulations suffer from different types of pitfalls. And uh, I want to address those. So the first one, which is the one that I don't address, is the issue of the force field. I think we can consider that in this area of uh, membrane proteins, there's been a lot of efforts done in that area and that we can trust the potential that describes the interactions. And so that is not something that I'll be uh, talking about at all in this talk. I'll just consider that uh, the charm force fields that we typically use are good quality for uh, this work. And then there are two other problems. There is a sampling problem, which is related to the fact that we usually would like to observe timescales that are longer, that are accessible to atomistic simulations, despite progress in, um, in hardware and software. Uh, but luckily, we have uh, enhanced sampling protocols available to us. So I'll describe to you how we think we design an appropriate enhanced sampling protocol for the problem here. Um, and then the second pitfall that people tend to uh, bring up when we talk about MD simulations is that they can be difficult to interpret and understand, not least because they can be very noisy and difficult to just uh, have a look at it for uh, somebody who's not used to uh, interpreting them. And to aid this, I'll show you how uh, we use machine learning based tools to uh, so-called demystify the data set. So let's, uh, let's go into uh, the actual um, project that I wanted to discuss today. And the central question is uh, whether we can predict uh, the response to a set of drugs for this GPCR, and can we interpret the modulation of the conformational ensemble 
following drug binding. And the data set that we have will consist of uh, seven uh, simulation sets, uh, one APO condition where we have no ligand bound, and then uh, binding of six different ligands. And those were chosen because we have structures of uh, GPCRs bound with these ligands, so we didn't have to do any docking or anything. We could just use this, this binding and not worry about that aspect of the problem. And the other reason those were chosen is that, as you can see on this figure, they range from being agonists. So this means that they activate the receptor uh, to a full extent, partial agonists, and then antagonists, which should be equivalent to the APO condition, and inverse agonists, which should have the opposite effect of an agonist, right? So between these seven conditions, we kind of cover the entire uh, realm of possibilities in terms of activation of the GPCR. Good, so now this leads me to um, choosing the appropriate enhanced sampling protocol. And I just want to insist a little bit on this in this specific talk because of the audience that you are. Um, and um, as I think many people would say, anyways, this is uh, what I really was confused about when I was a student and then a postdoc and sometimes still today is there are so many methods around there that are enhanced sampling and usually groups will write a paper saying that they have invented the best method and it's never really compared to many other things. So there's a project that we've been working on uh, specifically with Jérôme uh, to try and classify these different methods and hopefully we'll have a paper about this. But um, this is a little scheme that we came out with and uh, basically, um, we think that the forest of enhanced sampling protocols can sort of be organized according to uh, dichotomy. So are we driving the system out of equilibrium or not? Are we using transitions to other systems? Are we changing the temperature and so on and so forth? And this can help to distinguish classes of methods and actually realize that some are very similar, but they have different names and different formalisms. And also that modern methods that are more used today usually kind of um, uh, just mix strategies. So you will have, um, you know, replicas and changes in temperature, for example, that's a simple one. But uh, so mixing these different strategies, you can come out with uh, apparently pretty efficient methodologies. So that being said, and with that knowledge, um, I felt a little more confident in choosing what we should do. Um, and I should say also that I was kind of on the search for a silver bullet type of method that would work at, with anything. Um, I'm uh, you know, sad to report that uh, I did not find such a thing and I think it doesn't exist. So that's uh, kind of a little bit of a message here. So I think you should, figure out what you know about your system and you should uh, also have a good idea of all the methods that are out there and then based on this it's possible to make a hopefully informed decision. So what do we know about this specific system, our GPCR? Uh, we're in a pretty lucky situation compared to other projects that um, might be out there. First, we have uh, what I call n states in terms of structures. So we don't have only one state. Basically, we know what the endpoints of the systems are, the active and inactive states. Um, so that's maybe not so unusual. But what we were really quite lucky to have is a good guess of a pathway, because there had been Anton simulations run by Ron Jordan colleagues that were published uh, 10 years ago, actually. So that put us in a position where, you know, we, we already had a good idea of what the, the pathway might look like. Um, maybe uh, something we, that is not so lucky is that the path uh, seems to be very highly nonlinear. And if you think about what you described, what I described in terms of um, micro switches that were activated one after the other, it's not so surprising actually that this pathway is very nonlinear. So this means that these collective variable based methods, which I assume uh, many of you are familiar with like metadynamics or ABF, those are not well suited for this type of problem because it's so highly uh, nonlinear. We would need a high dimensional CV space and uh, these methods usually don't uh, perform super well on this. 
So with that in mind, we decided that uh, it would be probably a good idea to use the uh, string methods with swarms of trajectories in a high dimensional collective variable space. And the reason then for this is that, like I said, we have an initial path uh, that we can use and uh, also our, um, our um, space that, that describes the conformational ensemble uh, is presumably uh, in high dimensional. So that seems like a, a good choice for that, those reasons. So the string of swarms method um, is a little bit less popular than metadynamics. So I thought I would just uh, do a quick recap here. Um, the idea is to find the path that links uh, two minima, starting from an initial guess of the path that might be a straight line between, um, between free energy minimas and then launch um, a swarm of trajectories. So many very short uh, trajectories that will tend to drift. And um, uh, when looking at um, the average drift of those trajectories, we can assume that this pathway is moving downhill uh, until the minimum for energy path is found. And like I said before, we uh, had access to an uh, inactivating trajectory of the same receptor uh, that was published before. And so we uh, estimated the static string from the free energy surface that we estimated from this inactivating trajectory. So we didn't think that this was necessarily the optimal pathway, but we thought that we could do a density estimation and then Boltzmann invert that to find the free energy landscape and find the minimum path in that, um, uh, in that space uh, to get started with, right? Instead of starting from a straight, um, straight um, line between the two states, which could be dangerous because it could lead you to something very far from the minimum path. And uh, finally, the, the, the last aspect to this uh, was that um, to determine the, the uh, collective variable space that might be well suited, still quite high dimensional, but not too high dimensional that would allow us to converge the string. Uh, we used um, we use machine learning to on this partially converged conformational ensemble to determine the CVs. So I think, yeah, I put a slide on that. Um, so um, um, just recently, we put together a little um, toolbox, which is basically a sort of wrapper over some of the machine learning tools that are available through uh, scikit-learn and other um, Python libraries. Um, and uh, we, we, we then proposed to use um, both unsupervised learning and supervised learning methods to be able to determine uh, good collective variables. And so um, I'm, I'll, I'll talk more about the supervised learning methods that we use also for uh, determining uh, important degrees of freedom later. But for this uh, specific um, project, in order to find the collective variables, what we did was to use this specific B panel here um, and uh, we basically trained a so-called restricted Boltzmann machine, uh, which is um, uh, a neural network that basically contains uh, two layers, one with input features and one with hidden nodes. And then you fit a model that maximizes the joint probability between these two uh, components in the input layer and the hidden layer. And then it's possible to use something called layer-wise relevance propagation to determine which of the input features were important for the dimensionality reduction. Um, so this is a, maybe a lot of buzzwords, but uh, it's, as far as my understanding, um, all the tools from machine learning are available. And then basically just understanding the, 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 the sort of um, overall concepts uh, enables you to discover uh, important input features. And I should say that it's not so different actually to use the other unsupervised learning methods in that respect we, we tested, but we landed on uh, this specific thing in the paper that I'm presenting. Um, and I forgot to mention the input features here are all the inverse inter-residue C-alpha distances in the protein. 
Um, and then, so through this uh, layer-wise relevance propagation, we rank all the features by their importance. And then uh, we just extract the ones that had an estimated importance that is above 0.33 out of one. And that means that uh, we end up with a total of 41 uh, input um, distances that we will use as collective variables for the string method. So that was a little detour. I'm seeing uh, things popping up in the chat, but I can't actually see. So I don't know if those were urgent questions or people just leaving. It's fine. Should I just continue? I, it seems Shashank has a question. Go ahead, Shashank. Okay, so I have a related question on string method as well as the uh, uh, the machine learning uh, technique that you are using. So for the string method, we know that it depends on the initial choice of pathway. Mm -hmm. Although you did mention that you have starting and uh, end states, like two, two extreme states uh, known from uh, this PNS paper, but how do you make sure the pathway is uh, consistent or did you also try uh, to explore for another pathway so that to make sure it is converging? Yeah, no, that's a good question. So actually um, we didn't check uh, beyond, uh, let me go through the results and there are key points where I think we prove that it's, uh, that it actually works. But in principle, I agree with you. And actually now we're exploring also other methods with still with swarms, but that don't involve necessarily finding the minimum path, but, uh, finding the whole ensemble of paths. Um, so that's a good question, but yeah. Okay. And a related question on the CV discovery method where you're using the Boltzmann machine. So uh, is it an iterative process or is it like a one, one step process? I mean, the reason uh, I'm asking, it seems like there is an initial input, which is yeah. CL for those distances. So my idea was like, if it is, if the initial input is not well sampled, then, uh, then we might not even get a good collective uh, reaction coordinates for uh, the process. And so I don't think it's related to the input, but what I can say is that the solver is stochastic. So we actually repeat this uh, process of training a number of steps. I forgot how many exactly, 50 or something. And then we take the average from there to make sure that it's robust. And we, of course, characterize also the, the variance of the output to make sure that we have convergence. Hmm. Should I continue? Yes, go yeah. ahead, thanks. <laughs> okay. Um, so yeah, back to, uh, just because we were, uh, interrupted, I just want to make sure that you guys know where I'm going. So I covered in a little bit of detail, uh, how we, uh, find the CVs and, uh, now I'm going to, to show you the convergence of the string method and give you a little bit of detail methodologically about that. Um, so the way we, um, we, we start from this initial path, uh, but of course we need to, uh, even though we know what the ensemble looks like, we need to generate the starting conditions. And to do that, we use steered MD. Um, and then once we have steered, we make sure that we uh, conduct equilibration um, um, trajectories at each point. And those need to be relatively long to kind of forget about the memory from the, the steering. Um, and then from this, we launch uh, swarms of trajectories um, that, uh, that are 10 picoseconds long. And the number of trajectories that we, did, that we uh, consider in a swarm is done adaptively. So it ranges from 16 to 32, and we only add more than 16 in case that we don't get uh, convergence on the drift um, after uh, having 10 picosecond swarms. And then uh, those are re-equilibrated for 30 picoseconds after we have considered the drift. And in total, we do um, 300 iterations. And this means that the total simulation time will be around four microseconds. So, you know, if you compare with other enhanced sampling methods that are out there, this is a relatively cheap method. And of course, it has to do with the fact that it's, uh, that we're like, actually was just asked we're uh, sampling um, a one-dimensional pathway, even though it's very high dimensional, right? It is a one-dimensional object. So that's why it's relatively uh, quick to converge. Uh, though it does require pretty extensive computational resources, but anyways. Um, so I'm just showing here on the right an example of, the, of one of the strings that we converged to show you what it looks like. The initial string is in blue. 
And then uh, the future iterations are in different colors, which you can see here. And the final pathway uh, together with uh, the uncertainty associated is uh, shown in black. So you can see that from the initial pathway, we actually diverge quite a bit. And I, I didn't have space to show them all, but if you look at the pathways for all the different ligands, they actually end up being, uh, they all started from the same pathway, but they all end up being quite different. So this tells us that there, of course, the initial pathway has an importance, but we do reach different uh, pathways with different uh, ligands. So um, there's only, un there's, there's some influence, but it doesn't determine completely the ensemble. Um, and um, these are the types of uh, free energy landscapes that, uh, that uh, we might get. Um, and those now are projected onto the first uh, two, the top two collective variables that were determined before. But we can, in principle, project these landscapes onto any degree of freedom, right? And the way the free energy landscapes are obtained from the swarms is that we build a regularized transition matrix from the swarms of trajectories. And then we estimate the free energy landscape from the stationary probability distribution of this transition matrix using Boltzmann inversion. And I won't go into the detail of what's going on in this pathway. This is actually from a, a previous paper trying to determine, to show what the pathway actually looked like. But since in this work, I'm interested in those, the differences between the ligands, I'll just uh, skip over that uh, in order to get to the point faster. Um, so like I said, uh, the landscapes can be projected onto any degree of freedom. And so the first thing that we do is have respect for our uh, experimental colleagues and project the landscape along the microswitches that they think are important and that they're used to. Uh, and on the top figure here, uh, what we have is the uh, free energy landscape along the connector region microswitch. So that would be the pink one here. Uh, and what you can see is that as we go from APO antagonist and inverse agonist to agonist, you can see that the landscape um, is uh, reorganizing in favor of the more active states, the R star states, if you compare these agonists to the, to the, uh, the other ones. And on the bottom row here, we have a two-dimensional landscape where we have the displacement of TM6 at the bottom, the orange microswitch um, in X, and in Y, the, uh, the red uh, TM5 uh, bulge microswitch. So this is basically showing a two-dimensional landscape of the coupling between the extracellular domain and the intracellular domain. And kind of similarly to what I was just describing, uh, and um, you know, luckily for us, kind of showing that at least on a qualitative level, the sampling works. These activated states are more stabilized than the, the resting states. But more interestingly, I mean, this is interesting, of course, but <laughs> even more interestingly, um, you can see that the positioning of the free energy basins is quite a bit different from one ligand to the other. So this tends to state that these ligands are stabilizing different states uh, dif differently. And this um, is uh, very good for uh, potentially for drug discovery, right? Because it seems like they have a different effect, uh, even with uh, even small chemical differences. Um, and uh, this will hopefully answer the question I had before. Um, we wanted to see if we had not only a good qualitative agreement, but uh, more if we could have even a quantitative, uh, let's say if our free or sampling method was predictive of um, downstream activity. So what is plotted here is the expectation value of these different microswitches against the uh, maximum, maximal G protein mediated CM production. So that would be what is measured experimentally, I'd say. And you can see that for these two on the left, uh, which are the outermost um, uh, degrees of freedom or microswitches, you can see the correlation is really good, actually. So we have a R of 0.93 or minus 0.95. And the um, agonists, which are in shades of blue here, or purple are um, grouped together in both of those dimensions, 
whereas the uh, Eichon uh, inverse agonists are uh, grouped together. And um, I should say, I should have started with this maybe, we don't have values for uh, this BI ligand or for the Carazolo ligand. So this is indicated by stars here. So we just um, calculated where they would find themselves uh, based on the linear regression on the other points. And we found that uh, the full agonist BI here um, is, uh, is even more, has an even higher um, CAMP Emax than the other agonist, which is what we should be finding. So that was very good. And Carazolol, which is an uh, inverse agonist, just clusters together with APO, which is also what is expected. So this uh, tends to say that uh, we get a really good uh, quantitative agreement with experimental data. Now, if you look at the lower microswitches, the YY motif and the ionic log distance, you can see the R values here are much less good and the spread of points is kind of high. And actually the, the two ligands for which we don't have uh, C and Emax values are uh, predicted wrongly. And um, this actually did not surprise us that much. And that's because these microswitches here, they're just um, less um, uh, deterministically, uh, their population is less directly determined by ligand binding, as we had also mentioned in a previous paper. So um, that, uh, that means that if we're interested in quantitative predictions, it's the upper microswitches that should be considered and not the lower ones, which uh, are more probabilistic. Um, okay, so uh, now I'm uh, moving on into trying to understand what these states actually look like and in which way they're different. And uh, to do this, uh, we analyzed an uh, ensemble of active-like states. So uh, just forget about the string method uh, simulations. Just imagine that now we're uh, sampling only the active-like state. And we're doing this in an adaptive way to make sure that we sample the entire basin and that we don't uh, depend too much on the initial conditions, but still restrict it to this uh, basin of active-like state. Um, and we run dimensionality reduction on these ensembles uh, to see if uh, we could distinguish these states and in which way. Uh, so we have here a linear dimensionality reduction, PCA, and two nonlinear methods, multidimensional scaling and TSNE. And uh, it's quite interesting to see that with all these methods, the agonists cluster together or more closer together. Uh, than the uh, other ligands. Um, and uh, more interestingly, even the, the, this type of dimensionality reduction algorithm is able to distinguish active like states that are different, even for the agonists or for the inverse agonists and uh, antagonists. So um, it's related to what I was telling you when I was showing you the projected landscapes that were showing that these. Um, uh, that these um, uh, states were positioned slightly differently uh, along the, the microswitches, it seems like we can distinguish these states and that has not been shown experimentally before. So that's really intriguing. Um, and uh, this is just a similarity matrix uh, showing that, um, uh, that the, 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 the agonist bound uh, active light states are more similar to one another than to the agonists. Um, so how does uh, this control happen? How does the ligand then control the, uh, the conformational ensemble? Uh, what we did here is to train classifiers to distinguish active like states uh, that are sampled upon various ligand binding. And uh, we, uh, in that uh, little machine learning toolbox that I told you about before, we have three types of classifiers, KL divergence, right, random forest, and um, the auto uh, encoders. No, uh, what's it called? Uh, what is it called? Uh, let's call it a neural network. I'm sorry, I forgot what this one is called, but um, <laughs> let's say a predictive neural network. Um, and uh, we, we always try all of those uh, and end up 
usually seeing that they give uh, rise to similar predictions. So here I'm just showing results from KL divergence, which is really a, a simple uh, method, uh, but random forests were giving uh, similar uh, results. And so we train those to distinguish uh, the active light state ensemble that is sampled with various ligands. And we do this in two ways. Uh, first, this is a binary classification where we distinguish agonists from non-agonists. And then we have a, another classifier where we distinguish all seven conditions, APO and the seven different ligands. And it's quite intriguing actually that these two ways of doing the classification gives really, you know, in some ways quite different results. So what we can see here is that this NPXXY motif, which um, is um, a really important um, uh, region that uh, experimental people know very well about because it has this tyrosine that I mentioned to you before that's involved in the YY motif. Um, this shows up uh, both when we're classifying by, uh, in a binary way or when we're classifying all ligands. So this shows, and uh, this is also true, I should say, of this uh, TM6 helix, which is the one that moves outwards during activation. So both of those regions uh, show us up as important in both of these cases. Uh, but uh, there is uh, this TM5 bulge up here that only shows up as important when we're classifying agonists and non-agonists. And uh, this is really quite interesting because um, this means that there's a, there's a difference in the ensemble when we consider agonists versus non-agonists, but if we consider all ligands, this region is not different enough to pop up as important. So this really tells us that um, it's only agonists versus non-agonists that um, distinguish here. And so this led us to come up with this uh, scheme of how different ligands control the intracellular binding site conformation. And so, um, like I was just describing, the agonists uh, exert a direct control over the TM5 bulge, and this is actually done through um, direct interaction between a hydrogen bonding between a serine residue and the, the ligand. And uh, this gets transmitted to the connector region and to residues uh, in the core of the protein. And in addition to that, the ligand is also exerting direct control on TM7 which directly gets transmitted to the NPXXY motif, uh, which um, then uh, rearranges, and uh, to the TM6 displacement, which is an activation hallmark. But um, once I've said this, um, let's see if we can go in even more detail and look at the specifically these uh, degrees of freedom that showed up as important during our classification uh, exploration. And uh, so what we do in that case is to look at then at the distribution of distances uh, between important residues that show up as important. Uh, and we color them according to the, the ligand that is shown. And this gives us a lot of insight that I think is important for um, potential drug discovery because it, it has to do with really the details of interactions now. Um, and so what we see here is uh, that, um, uh, wait a second, yeah, that um, V206, which is here, can form interactions with T118 here, only in the presence of agonists, this is what you see on this axis here, and that seems to be due to direct um, hydrogen bonding between serine 207 and the ligand. Then um, on this axis, what can be seen is that agonists uh, induce a contraction between L284 and F321. So uh, F321 is here. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, in this region here. Um, and in fact, L284 is located on TN6 just above uh, the part of TM6 that kinks upon activation. And so that feature basically connects the uh, orange region, which is the transmembrane region, to the agonist uh, binding region through this PIF motif, which is also well known uh, in the structural biology community. Uh, a third uh, important uh, region that was picked up by the 
uh, classification algorithm is that S319 here can form uh, through its backbone a hydrogen bonding interaction with N51, which is here. And um, as you can see, it, this is only formed in the presence of agonists. And the reason uh, we think this is important is that this residue N51 is extremely conserved and it's responsible for, um, for uh, uh, the hydration of a cavity around itself and uh, notably D79, which is also really very conserved, um, and Y326, which is on the NPXXY motif. So it seems like when it's formed, this specific agonist interaction can promote dehydration of this cavity, um, which is uh, important for activation uh, through the twist of this NPXX format, even through uh, the orientation of Y326. Um, we also looked at long range contractions that were picked up by the classification. So these were local, right? They were really between residues that are located close to one another. Um, but here we can see um, long range contractions that were picked out. Um, and what can be seen kind of similarly to before is that the agonists favor a contraction of the entire protein. So these are, um, uh, these are interactions between these two residues across the entire binding site and between the serine residue and a residue that's not even on this picture because it's on the interfacial helix, uh, helix eight down here. Um, so these were picked out as important and they tend to contract um, when uh, agonists are bound. And then finally, uh, an interesting distance that popped up is uh, the distance that is projected onto this axis. And that, as you can see, is the only one that distinguishes the different agonists, uh, this purple, uh, blue, and uh, greenish uh, color here. Um, and what we saw when we looked on our molecular model here is that agonists stabilized uh, different orientations of uh, the helices TM6 and TM7. And adrenaline, uh, which is in uh, purple here, favored the most active-like NPXXY motif, while the biased agonist salmeterol uh, in this, uh, I don't even know what to call it, gray, gray green color, um, is stabilizing a distinct NPXXY conformation that brings the tyrosine into this cleft between TM6 and TM7. And this is an orientation that hasn't been shown uh, yet experimentally. Um, so, uh, so because it's a biased agonist, we think that this could be an important determinant for uh, biasing the signaling towards um, specific interests of the binding partners. Um, so tell me how I'm doing on time here. Well, I mean, if... Uh, I'm done, right? Five more minutes. Then we can switch to questions. So, um, so. Yeah, but I could stop here because uh, this was uh, opening a sort of new chapter. Um, oh. So I'll just uh, say what we did without telling you about the results. And then sure, sure. Sounds good. Can. Sounds good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so this is for published work, but uh, I just wanted to touch upon the fact that we're continuing this work. And now we're looking at what happens upon nanobody uh, binding. So nanobodies. Um, that uh, were raised against these, um, these GPCRs to kind of mimic what's going on in a uh, G protein. And uh, so I won't have time to go through this, but uh, let's say that we're just using similar methods to distinguish how the ensemble is reorganized, not only now by ligand binding, but also by G protein or nanobody binding. Um, and um, it's uh, interesting, but it's work in progress. So uh, I hope we'll be able to look into this in more detail. And uh, to conclude, I just want to recap really quickly the different steps I went through uh, to refresh your memory. So among all the possible enhanced sampling techniques, we found that the string of swarms is pretty cost efficient to sample equilibrium conformational ensemble of uh, GPCR activation. And I say GPCR here and not beta-2 adrenergic receptor because we're using similar protocols for notably the dopamine receptor and they seem to work, work uh, quite well. Um, we did this uh, by uh, in quite high dimensional uh, space 
uh, by picking out for about 40 collective variables that were extracted from unsupervised learning on a deactivation trajectory that was previously uh, published. Uh, in terms of results, we find that the distribution of other microswitches is predictive of downstream activity. And uh, we find also that active light states distributions depend on the bound ligand. Uh, and uh, we think that we can then scrutinize the conformational ensemble to learn important features. Uh, and of course, this is only a wish at this point, but uh, we hope that we can use this to further design, for example, biased agonists, uh, which would be very, um, in, very nice for, for drug discovery. Um, and then I don't have time to, to show you this, but um, when we, we can basically apply very similar protocols uh, to look at the combined effect of ligand and nanobody. And it seems that the nanobody uh, seems to stabilize different states from not nanobody bound and that these states are more similar uh, and less dependent on the ligand, but still we're able to pick out uh, small details um, of the states. Uh, so the molecular basis uh, for understanding this is, uh, is still in progress. And uh, before thanking you, uh, I want to say that a lot of this work was conducted by my PhD student, Oliver Fleetwood, who will be defending uh, very soon. Um, all the methods that uh, I presented were developed by him uh, and uh, my other PhD student, Annie Resteland, who uh, just uh, graduated. Uh, Marina Kasimova, who was uh, my postdoc, and Sergio Perez Canessa, who is a current postdoc. And the recent work has been picked up by a new PhD student called Yue Chen, uh, who's done this work on the nanobody. And the person who got me started on these G protein coupled receptor uh, projects is uh, Jens Carlsen. And a lot of the work is done in collaboration with him and uh, through very nice discussions. Uh, to, with him and his PhD student, uh, Pierre Matricon. And uh, of course, I would like to acknowledge uh, everyone who makes this work possible, not least uh, the fantastic uh, environment that we have in Stockholm, uh, together with, uh, with Eric Lindell and Burke Hess and uh, all the team. Uh, and thank you very much. Uh, I would be happy to answer more questions if there are any. Well, thank you very much, Lucy. Uh, I really feel bad to cut you a little short. I was really interested in the last part because I had some questions about G-protein uh, activation, but next time, <laughs> we can do it another time. Well, I mean, by, uh, uh, your seminar reminded me of what I always say about biology. So we understand the physics and chemistry principles of everything in principle. But biology is just too complicated. It just, there are just so many things. What you described about all these enhanced sampling techniques, all of them almost work beautifully when you're dealing with one or two collective variables or reaction coordinates. When you come to these beasts with so many things, then the majority of them unfortunately kind of fail. And it's nice to see that you are thinking about a kind of flow chart with Jerome to, to maybe actually guide us a little bit so uh, yeah, so that's, that's, that was very nice uh, coverage. We look forward to this work uh, uh, and paper. So, and then the students can actually use it. That's great. So I'm gonna open it to questions. Uh, we have quite a few questions. So let me start with Nandan who is a student and also asked the question first. Nanda. Uh, okay, uh, hello, uh, Professor Delamonte. It was very nice talk. Uh, so my question is uh, in uh, slide number 14, if you could... Uh, 14. Yeah, one four, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so here my question is you're looking at uh, uh, so two different uh, collective variables, for example, TM5 and uh, log distance, uh, uh, ionic log distance. So have you also looked at what happens to other residues? Does this population shift propagates along a pathway or it's just the end states are, are uh, affected by agonist versus uh, antagonist? Uh, yeah, so we have uh, projected uh, these landscapes along, I think, anything possible at some point. And in the supplementary information of this paper, there's a big figure that has uh, other degrees of freedom that you know people might be interested in if you want to check it out. 
Um, it's, I think from these projections, we can see the landscape really well. And this is better shown on those uh, specific um, uh, dimensions that were used to generate the conformational ensemble. Uh, on this, you can see that the, the so this is unfortunately only on two uh, APO versus the BI bounds, but we can see that the pathway is reorganized, um, like not only the population of states, but actually the, the details of which pathway has been taken in which order the rearrangement happens. And it's difficult to, to highlight really well, but if you go in even higher dimensions, so if you introduce a third, a fourth, and a fifth dimension, you see that the pathway is rearranging also in the other degrees of freedom, but it gets a little difficult to look at, basically. So these were the, the top two that we found were already showing that, uh, you know, if you go from inactive to active in the presence of APO, you kind of go on a diagonal in, uh, in the APO state. But in the, in the agonist bound, we see that you first need to um, have TN6 that moves away. Then there's a, uh, then the distance between TM2 and TM7 becomes smaller. And then finally, you have another small outward movement of TN6, right? So you can look at these landscapes in that way, uh, if uh, that's interesting. So it's an indication of that, not just uh, the, the and state also the uh, also the pathway itself also can deviate from each other based on what ligand binds, right? Yes, exactly. I think so. But we, I have to say, we didn't do this in a, in great detail in the paper with the seven ligands. Okay, thank you. Okay, okay, Claudio. There you are. Hi, Lucy. Hello. Oh, hi, <laughs> Claudio. Hi, I was like, <laughs> yeah. Nice to see so. you. Lucy was the postdoctoral advisor of one of my graduate students, Tyler. Mm -hmm. So Lucy, um, being an experimentalist, this is all very interesting, but I get lost very easily. Uh, so you described a lot of interactions, right? Between side chains along your talk. Uh, my question are, and I'm trying to probably get more general things out of this because mm -hmm. the details are too difficult for me. But mm -hmm. uh, are we talking about interactions happening in the end states or along the pathway? Because for the end states, we have data already. We have cryo EM atomic models or exo crystal structures. So those interactions are already in the data. These interactions you are talking about, this, I don't know, you spoke about hydrogen bonds forming, the whatever, whatever that you were discovering. Are those present in the end states? Are those appearing in the pathway? Go ahead. Okay, good question. And I'm sorry, uh, I, I had to choose what to present and I decided to make this relatively technical. I hope it was still somewhat interesting for people who are not as technically oriented. Sure. Good question, nevertheless, uh, Claudio. So um, on this last part, uh, I was uh, basically talking about the differences between active light states only. So we sampled using molecular dynamic simulations, the free energy basing uh, around the activated states only. So we don't have the full pathway in that case, that's only the active state. But on these plots, each of the points represents a single snapshot from an MD simulation. So you can see, right, that um, there's not only one configuration that sampled, but that they are you know, in some degrees of freedom quite extended and in some other ones uh, quite narrow. Um, so we're talking about here only one, um, let's say one, one state in the sense of the basin uh, of it. Uh, now what I was describing before here, that was uh, for the entire pathway. And uh, here I didn't go into detail and talk about the uh, the interactions, but of course we can describe the different interactions if we want to once we have the, the landscape, but this was not the aim, I'll say, of this part. But let's say in the previous slide you showed me with all the clouds of points. Yes. Uh, let's suppose, just to talk about something. Here, uh, this is the active state, as you said, and my question is, are there structures? I, I don't follow the GPCR field mm -hmm. as much as I should. Are there structures of 
the beta-2 adrenergic receptor with the blue kind of ligand or with the greenish kind of ligands? Yeah, no, good question. Not always. So what we do sometimes is that we look at other GPCRs that have the same ligand bound and try to see if we see similar changes occurring mm. or not. So that was the case. Uh, I forgot if it was with some metal or adrenaline, one of the two. Um, so uh, we, we don't, I guess that's where you're going. We don't have experimental validation for all of this. Uh, if we did, this would become a little bit irrelevant, I should mention. So, I mean, my, this is a general question. I, I, right. speak, I, I talk to Emad always about this. Uh, it's my position as an experimentalist looking at computational biology. Yeah, can I draw your attention to this uh, beautiful uh, correlation? Yes, uh, yes, I, I, this is the type of thing I like. Yes, no, no. <laughs> so, but you're right. So I think this is a, a valid point. Um, we, we, we try to make connections when we can. And I was actually surprised because I went to this project I was telling you a few years ago based on, uh, on uh, Jens Carlsen. As experience, and I was expecting to find a lot more direct connections with experiments because there's so much published on this receptor. Yeah. And it turns out it's actually quite difficult to make connections because you know even if it's uh, thing, very nice things like um, uh, um, what's it called, uh, even NMR, these sort of things, it's it turns out pretty difficult to go from an ensemble of molecular simulations to the experiments, even if it's supposedly pretty high resolution. So we, I was very excited to see this uh, correlation because I think it gives us confidence that the rest is hopefully not entirely our sure. imagination. No, 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 definitely. Um, yeah, we, we talk with Claudio all the time, so he reminds me about experimental validation. I remind him exactly what you said, that we want to go beyond what experiments cannot do so, sometimes, actually. I, and I, I agree. No, no, no. But the, 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 yeah. the point is, if we are describing computationally the structure, the active state of the GPCR bound to ligand A, because there isn't a structure for it. And then the structure appears. I mean, of course, the structure need not be correct. Maybe this computation is correct. And the, right. we, are, we are learning every day with more and more cryo -EM papers that there, must, that there may be lots of artifacts out there. Uh, Absolutely. Absolutely. I don't know. I'm just thinking that one needs to contrast one or the other before sure, we do it as much as we can as we said every time there is an opportunity to compare we do that but yeah okay thanks Claudio uh Chun uh yes uh hi um this is a very uh, actually full of content very uh fruitful very nice talk I have a question concerning the method you use um, so you, in your talk, you kind of mentioned that you try different classifier um, to analyze the data and they perform more or less the same. Mm -hmm. uh, as I know, I mean, I only know like one of them, mostly let's say the random forest. Uh, after you perform the training, you have a chance to decide like the, the parameters that you can choose, like in what case you accept the classification to be true and not. Like, I want to know how you decide that parameters. Is there like some factors that you take into account from the biological aspect or do you uh, maybe like uh, just like optimize the parameters to uh, for like some standard score used in the machine learning dis discipline? Yeah, so really good questions. And we went through this quite a lot when we were preparing this methodological paper. Um, so by the way, I remember this is called a multi-layer perceptron. <laughs> oh. So these are the three types of methods that we have. So first I should say uh, the KL divergence, the, the, what is very nice about it is that it's parameter free pretty much. Um, so that one, the problem is that it doesn't always perform so well, but it's parameter free. Um, then the, the neural networks in general and the multiple layer perceptron in particular, those are really awful in terms of hyperparameters. There's so many things to pick, you know, including number of layers, number of nodes, what type of activation function, what type of connection, blah, blah, blah. So this is really quite difficult. Uh, random forest is a bit kind of in the, uh, in the middle. So the approach that we took, and we had a merciful reviewer who even said, you know, it would be a bit much to ask for you guys to test all of the <laughs> <laughs> hyperparameters, but can you test to the maximum extent or something? 
So we did a little bit of hyperparameter tuning, um, but mostly we tend to test different methods with a few hyperparameters and we're satisfied when uh, things uh, are robust, right? When they kind of converge uh, between I different see. methods. I uh, but I do agree with you that this is a potential problem. So whenever KL divergent works, uh, as in it's not too noisy, I think it's quite nice to use. I see, thanks. Okay, so the last question, we give it to David DeSancho. Question about the uh, GPCR mechanism, not the methodology. Go ahead, David. Uh, yeah, well, thank you for the fantastic talk and for making these uh, available to people outside the group, uh, first of all. And then, uh, yeah, I was, this was maybe partly addressed by, by um, Claudio Grossman's question uh, before, but uh, I, I was going to ask again about the correlation uh, be, between the signaling that you have observed and this expectation value. Um, I guess that uh, it's, it's really impressive that you're capturing this. And, and what I'm not entirely sure is, uh, maybe, maybe you've explained it, is uh, whether you know how these downstream effect can be captured uh, so accurately from these uh, like TM5 TM bulge distance, which in, in principle mm -hmm. is quite far away from what the, the signaling should, should actually be uh, uh, resulting on. So how, how does these like downstream signaling result from what are apparently just different weights of conformational states rather far away? Yeah, so that's a really good question to which I'm not going to have a very good answer. I think uh, it's intriguing, like you say. Um, so in the in the previous paper, we had found that the ligand uh, it was bi uh, 167 107 in that case that was really exercising a direct control on these two um, on these two microswitches. Then the rest of the microswitches are the let's say, I think we called it a probabilistic uh, um, control in the sense that it shifts the landscape, but it doesn't, you know, prevent a specific state from occurring or it doesn't really control one state. So in that sense, I thought that it made sense that there was a better correlation between the, the response and the microswitch distribution. But now that you ask this question, I wonder if that really makes sense um, because like you say, it's kind of far downstream and I, I don't know how this happens beyond what I just described, which is that these states are all slightly different. Mm -hmm. So I'm sorry, it's not a very satisfactory answer. Okay, good. So let's, we should let you go. This is already past 7 p.m. your time, Lucy. Thank you very much again for accepting our invitation and uh, giving us the stimulating seminar. Very interesting results and very relevant results. Uh, and it's great to see you and many other friends. Thank you very much. Okay. Can, I, can I stay on with, uh, what was your name? And, 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 Nandan, Nandan. Nandan, sorry, I got the first letter wrong. Sure, of course. <laughs> Everybody else have a great day or evening or morning, wherever you are. Claudia, you have, you seem to have, want to say something. Or... No, 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 no. I just wanted to say Nandan. goodbye Thank to you. Lucy. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> Good to see you, Lucy. Bye-bye. Thank you very much for the invitation and the nice discussion. Okay, I'm going to leave Nandan.